We are in the, the fourth week of Galatians, and so we've got one more after this. Uh, next Sunday will be our last sermon in, in the, the letter to the Galatians. And so I spent two weeks on chapter one, spent one week on chapter two. Today we are going to cover chapter three, chapter four, and chapter five. And so I plan on having you out here by two o'clock. Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> we're, we're actually not going to read all three chapters in their, their entirety, but we're going to kind of take little sections of each and we're going to weave together this really powerful message that Paul is trying to convey to the, to the Galatians. And uh, I've been telling you how his message to the Galatians was that the law of Moses is done away with. All 613 of these religious rules that every Jewish person observed, they, they no longer had to do it. But in its place is a new law. And it's a law of the Spirit. It's the, it's the Holy Spirit. And so beginning in, in Galatians chapter 3, Paul begins talking about the Holy Spirit and, and uh, how the Holy Spirit is what empowers us to live for God. Religious rules don't, don't empower us to live for God because we're lawbreakers. We're lawbreakers. I mean, you can have all the rules in the world and we're going to end up breaking them. So religious rules do nothing to empower us to live for God. It is the Holy Spirit that empowers us to live for God. And so, so I want to I start out with uh, uh, just a little bit of an analogy of what it, what it means to walk in step with the Spirit. Um, most of you know that my wife and I, uh, we don't have any children. We, we got married late in life. And so we were na- never able to conceive children. And so even though we don't have children, we do have a baby. Isn't he cute? That is our pride and joy. His name is Buddy. And uh, he's 10 months old. He's a poodle mix. And uh, Buddy got his hair cut the other day, and he looks nothing like that uh, now. And so when, when we went to pick him up at the groomer, I started laughing at him because he looks so different. You know, looks like a little squirrel. You know, but, but that's Buddy. And uh, Buddy, what's interesting is that uh, we bought Buddy the, the very same day that I heard about Bristol Missionary Church needing a pastor, September 17th of last year. So that day, when I woke up that day, I had no idea how monumental that day was going to be in my life. But we, we bought Buddy that day, and I heard about Bristol Missionary Church that day. And uh, so anyways, the analogy I want to make is, is that um, this past Wednesday, it was a beautiful day. It was, it was 55, it was sunny, and so I took Buddy for a walk uh, over here at Bonneville, and you know, they have walking trails, and he had never been there before, first time he had ever been uh, to Bonneville, and, and so he was running, and he was exploring, and he was sniffing, and doing everything that a dog's supposed to do, and as I'm walking with him, God just kind of showed me something that's very... Uh, that's a great analogy to the spirit-filled life, the spirit-led life, is that he felt empowered to be a dog because I was present. Because he, he, no, he had no idea where he was at. And so he would run ahead of me, and then he would look back and make sure I was there, you know. And then he would run over here, and then he would run over there, and he always kind of kept me in his line, line of sight, you know. And uh, he'd be sniffing and doing all these things, and he never let me get very far away from him because he didn't know where he was at. But my presence empowered him to be all that God created him to be. And so I, this was occurring to me as we're walking, you know, and I thought, this is such a beautiful analogy for a spirit-led life. And I thought, I would wonder, wonder what happened if I hid from him. And so, and so we're walking, and I'm waiting for him to get ahead of me, you know, and finally he gets about 20 yards ahead of me, and I jump behind a bush. And, you know, and, he, and he's walking, he looks back to make sure I was there, and he didn't see me. And he comes flying back at full speed, to make sure that he could find me because my presence empowered him to be everything that God intended for him to be as a dog. And it's just a beautiful analogy of what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. The Holy Spirit empowers us to be everything that Christ intended for us to be as believers in Jesus Christ. And if we don't understand the role of the Holy Spirit, then you are living a life of, of, of weakness when you could be living a life of power if you understand the role of the Holy Spirit. So as starting in Galatians chapter 3, Paul begins his discussion on the role of the Holy Spirit, uh, how it has taken the place of these, all these religious rules. 
And so, oh yeah, here's, here's a picture. That's us on the trail. Isn't that, isn't that cool picture? Oh, that, was, that was a great day. That was such a fun day. So let's, uh, let's start with Galatians chapter 3. And, and, uh, and we're going to read a little bit of 3. We're going to read a little bit of 4. And we're going to read a little bit of 5. Uh, Galatians chapter 5. And, and Paul's language is so strong here, especially when you get to chapter 5. He really set, has, uses some strong language because he's just frustrated with the Galatians because the, he had convinced them that they no longer had to live by the law of Moses and all those 613 rules, and yet they went right back to observing all those rules. And his message went to them, as I've been telling you, and that is Jesus and Jesus only. You don't need to observe all these rules. So beginning with chapter 3, he really amps up his harsh language, as you will see. And he says this, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly betrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again I ask you, does God give you His Spirit and work, work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So then, so those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who was hung on a tree. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could, that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. So we're going to stop there. If you have your sermon notes, there's a lot of information there. And, uh, and, I, and uh, maybe not all of this will sink in this morning, but take that home, that, that, that outline, Read through those scriptures and ask the Holy Spirit just to teach you um, everything that we're going to learn today. And so there's two things that we, that we learn from this first passage in Galatians 3. And the first one is that salvation and the Holy Spirit are given by faith, not by religious rules. Okay? Salvation and the Holy Spirit are given by faith, not by religious rules. And so Paul asks this rhetorical question. He says, I ask you, does God give you his spirit? and work miracles among you by the law or by believing what you heard, so also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now Paul realizes something's going on here because the law of Moses was more than just a religious system that they went by. It was actually their ethnic identity. Every Jew, and to this day, every Jew, from the moment they are raised, from the moment they are born, they are taught the Torah, the law of Moses. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. I mean, they, they have it memorized. It is part of their ethnic identity. And so when Paul's telling them, you don't have to live by the law of Moses again, it's like ripping the rug from underneath them on their cultural and their ethnic identity. So it's no wonder that they easily went back to the law of Moses and started observing it again because that's all they knew and it's how they identified themselves. And so Paul tries to address this ethnic identity issue by bringing up Abraham. And Abraham, you know, Father Abraham had many sons. You ever heard that song? You know, had many sons, had Father Abraham. He was the, the, the uh, father of, of the Jewish people. And so Paul addresses this whole ethnic identity with the law of Moses by going straight to Abraham. He says, Abraham was not justified by God in God's faith and God's um, sight by by observing a bunch of rules. He was justified in God's sight because he believed what God said. 
He says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. What's he talking about? Let's go back to Genesis, I'll tell you. Genesis 15, this is what it says, And the Lord took him outside, Abraham, and said, Now look to the heavens and count the stars if you are able. Then he declared, So shall your offspring be. So God promised Abram uh, this, that he'd be the father of many nations. And Abram believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. So his righteousness came because he believed what God said. It wasn't because he observed a bunch of religious rules. And so Paul, in, in Romans, picks this up and says, you know, Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness before the law of Moses was even put into effect. And so he's saying the precedent is that salvation comes by believing in Jesus Christ and the word of God, not by observing a bunch of religious rules. And so, uh, so anyways, so Ephesians, this is a great passage to learn and to memorize because it speaks to, it speaks to what happens when we first believe. Ephesians 1 says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him, uh, in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Anybody who calls on Jesus, who says, I believe in Jesus, who has received Jesus, has the Holy Spirit, whether you realize it or not. Everybody does. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Now the question is, do you recognize the Holy Spirit in you? That's the real question. Hopefully by the end of this sermon, uh, you'll be able to recognize the Holy Spirit in you because we're going to look at some indicators of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. So, First, so salvation and the Holy Spirit are given by faith, not by religious rules. Uh, religious rules, Paul says, are a curse. The law was a curse because it condemns us as lawbreakers. Paul says, for all who rely on the works of the law, and this means any rules, are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Because it was such an impossible standard to live up to that the moment that you broke one of those rules, you were condemned. That's what he means by it's a curse. And so there's, there's, there's what I call the bad fruit of religious rules, okay? So anybody who lives in a, or goes to a church or anybody who lives in a community where there's all these religious rules, this is what's going to come, come of that. Condemnation, fear, guilt, joyless conformity, rebellion, and pride. And let me quickly go through those. Condemnation, because the moment you break one of those rules, they're on you, right? You know? Or you feel condemned yourself. You feel fear uh, because you're, you're fearful you might get caught. You know, if you break one of those rules, oh my goodness, I'll, you know, I might get caught. You feel guilt because you broke one of those rules and you feel guilty about it. Joyless conformity, you feel like you have no option but to go along and observe all these religious rules because if you don't, then you're going to be in trouble. Rebellion, that's when someone says, if this is what Christian is supposed to be about, no thank you. You know, I'm out of here. And we see this a lot in, in the communities around us where there's a lot of religious rules, you know, especially among the Amish. A lot of rebellion. I had an Amish neighbor her name was Ruby. She was single. She was just a few months younger than me. She'd always tell me, Rod, I'm Amish on the outside, but I'm not Amish on the inside. <laughs> and so she had a cell phone, you know, secret cell phone. She had a, this little TV that she hid underneath her bed. You know, rebellion, you know, that's, that's what you get. And, and sometimes, and sometimes it's, it's, you know, it's, um, it's out there and rebellion, they don't care who finds out. And sometimes it's a, it's a secret rebellion. And, and then lastly, pride. That's when you walk around and you say, I have every rule mastered. Look how righteous I am. Look how wonderful I am. And they pat themselves on the back. And usually someone who has a religion, a pride, uh, they're, they're, they're hard on everybody else, but easy on themselves, right? That's usually how it goes. The bad fruit of religious rules, that's what you get. Condemnation, fear, guilt, joyless conformity, rebellion, and pride. Christ came to save us, redeem us from all of that. 
So the bad news is, I've got bad news and I've got good news, okay? The bad news is that religious rules are, they're righteous. The law of Moses was a righteous uh, law, but it's unattainable. And this is what Paul says in Romans 7. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. And what he's saying there is there wasn't a, a, there wasn't a, a speed limit sign. I, I wouldn't be a lawbreaker, would I? But the moment you put up a speed limit sign, we all become lawbreakers, don't we? Because I don't know anybody who doesn't speed. You know, down here on US 20, uh, the bypass right in front of uh, Alcona, it's four lanes and the speed limit's 50. It's like, what were they thinking? 50? I mean, it's four lanes, you know? And so I, I never go 50. Ask my wife. You know, she's always, she's always on me not to go 50, you know? And the police, they like to monitor that, you know? The law is good. That law is good because it's intended for our safety. Just as the, the law of Moses was good, it was intended for holiness. But the moment you put up a law, the moment you put up a speed limit sign, we're breaking it because we're lawbreakers. And that's what Paul is saying here. Religious rules are righteous. I mean, they're good, but they're unattainable because we are, by nature, lawbreakers. I, I gave the example a few weeks ago. If you were to line up children in a hallway, remember that example? If you line up children in a hallway and you said, children, you can open up any door uh, in this hallway except for the door on the left. You can't open that door. What would they do? <laughs> they would go right to that door, wouldn't they? Because by nature, we are lawbreakers. And the moment you say there's a law, we're breaking it. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. Christ fulfills the righteous requirements of the law for us on our behalf. The next chapter in Romans 8, this is what he says, but what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh because we're lawbreakers. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. It'd be like if I got drafted to go into the army and I had to fight in a foreign war and someone stepped in and said, hey, you stay home, I'm going to go on your behalf. They would fulfill that requirement for me. That's what Paul is saying here. Christ fulfilled those righteous requirements that no one can live up to on our behalf. That's the good news. And so we're going to continue uh, in the next chapter, uh, Galatians chapter 4. I love this, love this passage. He says, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his children, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child and since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Does anybody know what the word that Abba means in Hebrew? Daddy. daddy. That's right. Isn't that amazing? It means daddy. Yeah. So the work of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in our life, is to bring fellowship and intimacy with God so that we can call him daddy. I don't know of any other religion in the world that would make that claim. You know, that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth is our daddy. Isn't that amazing? And what's sad is that some, a lot of people who come from an abusive relationship with their father, they, they have a hard time connecting that because all they know of is abuse, you know, at the hands of a father. And it takes the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit to work in their heart and those damaged emotions to help them see that God is not an abusive God, but he is our daddy who wants to love us and wants to protect us. So that's one of the workings of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live for God as our Father, as our Heavenly Father, as our Daddy. 
to call him Abba Father, as it says in Galatians 4, uh, verse 6. And so, uh, so we had the bad fruit of religious rules. Here's the good fruit of a spirit-filled faith. Joyful obedience, confidence, fellowship, int intimacy with God, and the convincing of sin. None of this you'll get by observing religious rules. This only comes through the filling and the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take all four of those and I'm going to uh, give you a scripture that goes with each of these and I'm going to give you an illustration that goes with each of those, okay? So the first one is joyful obedience. Uh, we're going to go back to the Old Testament because God gave the law of Moses to Israel at Mount Sinai and what did they do is right after that? Does anybody remember? The golden calf, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they rebelled. I mean, it was like right off the bat. They're like, you know, you know, you can only have one God, no God before me. Okay, God, let's go make a golden calf. You know, and, and they rebelled at the very moment that they had uh, the law of Moses in their hands. And if you read the history of Israel all throughout the Old Testament, it's rebellion, rebellion, rebellion. Rebellion, rebellion, and God would... Give them warning after warning after warning. I'm going to take your land away from you if you don't stop worshiping other gods, you know. And then he would take their land away from them. Then they repent. We're sorry. God would give the land back to them. And then what would they do again? They would rebel again. It was just nothing but rebellion because religious rules do nothing to transform you on the inside out and make you want to live for God. My wife's pointing at me. What's okay? I'm fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank God for wives. I love my wife. <laughs> So anyways, so finally in Ezekiel chapter 36, God makes this promise that is, even though it's an Old Testament promise, it's true for us today. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And so the ability to live for Christ, to, to live in a way that honors him, is not something we can do on our own. It's, it's empowered. We're empowered to do that through the spirit that lives, lives in us. A joyful obedience to serve Christ. And we do it joyfully. Not, we don't do it because begrudgingly, because we have to. That's religious rules. So I want to give you an example. Um, <clears throat> I heard this story about these, these teenagers uh, after Friday night, after a, after a football game, uh, these group of teenagers decided to go to someone's house whose parents weren't there, and they were going to drink, you know, alcohol and party and stuff. And and one of the girls was a, a believer in Jesus, and she's like, mm, you know, guys, that's just not really what I do. So I think I'm just going to go home. And uh, and they started teasing her and you know making fun of her. And um, one girl said, "What's the matter? Are you afraid you're going to uh, afraid you're going to hurt your daddy?" All right, I'm sorry, are you, afraid, are you afraid your daddy's going to hurt you? And she said, no, I'm afraid I'm going to hurt my daddy. That's, that's joyful obedience. You know, that's joyful obedience. I mentioned our dog, you know. We had a problem with him running into the neighbor's yard, so we finally put up a fence to keep him in, you know. That fence represents religious rules where you're forced to, to stand and, you know, to align with, uh, with it. You know, a joyful obedience is there's no fence. You, you do what God calls you to do out of the abundance of your love for him. It's, it's a joyful obedience. Second one, confidence. A lot of people who, who um, observe a bunch of religious, religious rules thinking that's how you please God, they have no assurance of their salvation. They have no confidence of that they, they would go to heaven. You just ask them because their salvation depends on them, on what they do, Right? 1 John 4, 13 says, This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. So one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to confirm in our hearts and in our minds that we are saved, that we have salvation. Because our confidence is not in us. It's in Christ and what he has done for us. Ephesians 3, 12 says, In him and through him uh, we may approach in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I don't know any other world religion that tells you that you can approach the throne of heaven with freedom and confidence, but you can because he's our daddy, right? Anybody done this with your child? 
I have a nephew, Brandon. Uh, Brandon has a two-year-old little boy. And uh, Brandon was, uh, he was telling me, uh, his name is Oliver. His name is Oliver Holmes. Oliver Wendell Holmes, you know. I don't know if, and they had never heard of Oliver Wendell Holmes when they named him Oliver Holmes. And so, I, you know, today's generation, you know, whatever. But anyways, um, <laughs> his, his, name is, his name is Oliver. So Oliver Holmes. So Ollie. And, he, and so Brandon was telling me that Ollie likes to stand on the, the armrest of the chair and jump off, daring his dad to catch him. And so he, he said that, he, Brandon said, I could be clear across the room, and Ollie will jump on the arm and just launch himself into the, into the air. And he says, I got to run and dive and catch him, you know. And because why does he do that? Because he trusts his dad. He has confidence in his dad that he's going to catch him. The Holy Spirit empowers us to have confidence in our Heavenly Father who's going to catch us when we fall. Confidence. Third one, fellowship, intimacy with God. The Spirit you received, oh, this is, this is out of Romans. The, the Spirit you received, the Holy Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship and daughtership. I'll put that in there. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit allows us to have fellowship and intimacy with the God of this universe who created us for that very reason. God did not create us just to leave us and abandon us at the grave with no hope for eternity. He didn't create us to be some distant, far-off God who has no interest in the life of his children. He created us for fellowship and intimacy with God, and that happens because of the Holy Spirit in us. Anybody remember this picture? Here's the the President of the United States, the most powerful man on earth. In order to have an appointment in the Oval Office, you have to be a dignitary or a politician, someone elected to office, some powerful person. You probably have to wait a week or two or months to get an appointment with the most powerful man in the world, unless you're his child. And his child can walk in at any moment, at any given time, and bring his toys in and play underneath the presidential uh, desk. That's such a beautiful image of what it means to have fellowship and intimacy with the God of this universe who created us. And that only happens because of the Holy Spirit within us. The convincing of sin. You know, when I first put this sermon together, I I used the word conviction. But conviction has kind of a negative connotation because we think of a prisoner, you know, someone who was convicted. Convincing of sin. Jesus says this in John 16, but very truly I tell you, it is for good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Verse 13, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you in all truth. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to bring about a convincing of the sin in our life uh, to say, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore because that doesn't, that doesn't honor God. One of the most profound experiences, I've had a, a number of really powerful experiences in my life where God has spoken to me. And what, one is I was driving down the road. This was about 12 or 13 years ago. I was driving down the road and, and my life wasn't right with God. I had allowed some things in my life that shouldn't have been there. And I was driving down the road and I was listening to a sermon and to this day I can't remember who it was and I can't remember what they said. I just remember the effect of it. I was driving down and I was listening to this sermon and whoever it was said something that so penetrated my heart that it overwhelmed me with my emotions. And I, had, I literally had to pull over into a parking lot and I wept. It was so convincing, <laughs> convincing me of, of the sin in my life that I needed to repent and sa- I sat there in that, in that automobile and I wept and I repented because I had allowed something in my life that shouldn't have been there. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our lives that convinces us of sin. So, has the Holy Spirit spoken to you? You can look at these four things and this is a small list. It goes on and on. There's a number of things I could have come up with. Joyful obedience, confidence. Do you feel confident, confident in your faith? You feel like you have a fellowship and intimacy with God. 
Has he convinced you of sin? You know, I've, ha I've had a number of, I've had people say to me, well, I don't, I've never heard the Holy Spirit in my life. And I, anybody who says this, I would ask this question. Is there something that you used to do that you no longer do because your heart won't allow you to go there? If you can answer yes to that question, then you've heard the Holy Spirit in your life, okay? You've heard the Holy Spirit in your life. So we're going to jump ahead to Galatians chapter 5. You are running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. The Holy Spirit always builds up. It never cuts down. Okay? The Holy Spirit always builds up. It never cuts down. And this is what he's saying in verse 8. Whoever, whoever said that to you, whatever persuaded you, to go back to these religious rules, that is not the one who has called you. That's not the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit always builds up. He never tears down. So if you hear a voice in your head that's saying that, you know, that God doesn't like you or that God's mad at you or that, or that, um, that you're worthless and all these things, that is not from God. That is from the enemy of your soul who wants to keep you imprisoned in a, in a state of hopelessness and a state of guilt and despair. The Holy Spirit always builds up. He never cuts down. And so, um, could you, there we go. Romans 5. I love this verse. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The Holy Spirit does not put us to shame the Holy Spirit does not put us to shame. I love this quote from Arch Sophrony uh, in his book, His Life is Mine. He says this, The Holy Spirit comes when we are receptive. He does not compel. He approaches so meekly that we may not even notice. If we would know the Holy Spirit, we need to examine ourselves in the light of the gospel teaching to detect any other presence which may prevent the Holy Spirit from entering into our souls. And what he's saying that the Holy Spirit is such a gentleman that if you've got other things in your life that are filling you up, that, that, are, uh, that are stand opposed to the things of God, the Holy Spirit is going to stand back and wait for the day until you're receptive for him to work in your life. Next week we're going to be talking about breaking the chains of the flesh. That'll be our last one in Galatians. And it's all about the Holy Spirit, um, how the Holy Spirit empowers us to break those chains of the flesh. So I, I want to end with this quick story. Uh, I used to live in Emma. I think I told you that. You know, Emma's all Amish. And so I drove Amish, uh, drove Amish, you know, for hire. I, that's how I put myself through, se through seminary. And one day I got a phone call from an Amish guy. He wanted me to take him over to see his cousin who owned a used furniture store in Goshen. And, uh, and so uh, uh, they, they wanted to uh, exchange some family history information. And so, so I'm driving them over there, and this Amish guy starts telling me about his cousin. He says, I haven't seen this guy in 25 years. He spent like 20 years in prison. He said, he was a bad dude. I mean, he, uh, he, was, a, he was in a motorcycle gang, and uh, he uh, you know, uh, got in criminal activity and went to prison. And, and, and he said, this is the first time I've seen this guy in 25 years. And, and so we go to this used... Uh, used furniture store, and we walk in, and, and his cousin's sitting behind the, the, his desk, and on his desk is a Bible. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. You know, so they, they do their business, you know, he's there for probably an hour, and so on the way home, I said, hey, I noticed that your cousin has a Bible on his desk. He's like, yeah. He's like, he told me the most amazing story. And he said, you know, he got out of prison, and he moved uh, into a house on the same street as this church. And so in order to drive, go home, he always had to drive by this church, and it made him mad. He said he would drive by this church, and he'd always, you know, he'd kind of have this stirring up. You know, this is a man who was raised Amish and religious rules. He rebelled against those re religious rules and ended up spending time in prison. So in his mind, he had a bad taste for the things of God. And so every time he'd drive by this church, he'd just, oh, just stir him up, you know. And, and so it got, got so bad that he tried finding different ways to get home, you know, uh, so he didn't have to drive by this church. And one day, it just, it just it was so irritating him. He said, God, he said this to God. He said, God, if you want me to go to that church, I'll go, but I'm only going one time. You know, I'm only going one time. 
And so one Sunday morning, he walks into this church, heard the gospel, surrendered his life, and bit by bit, God started to transform that man's life. That only happens through the Holy Spirit. Because the flesh does not go from darkness to light on its own. It just doesn't. It takes a power greater than ourselves. And that power is the Holy Spirit. So, um, if you believe in Jesus, know that you have the Spirit of God in you. You do. You just may not recognize it. And so, my challenge to you is to, is to listen and say, do I, hear the, do I hear the Spirit of God in me in those ways that I talked about? And this is what I want to do. I'm going to stand out here. If you, I'm going to pray. If you would just like to know, to be able to recognize the Spirit of God in you, as I pray, I just want you to lift your hand out towards me, okay? And say, yeah, that's me. I mean, I could always use more of that, you know, recognition. And I believe that God will honor that, that you'll be able to listen and hear the work of God in your life and the Spirit who empowers you to be everything that God intended for you to be. Amen. Amen. So God, I just pray, Lord, for every one of us here, God, that we would recognize the power of your Spirit in us. God, you gave us that Spirit. As Jesus said, it is for our benefit. It's, it's for our advantage that we have the Spirit because without the Holy Spirit, we have no ability to live for you because we're of the flesh. God, it requires something greater than ourselves, your Spirit within us. I pray, God, that we all recognize and be able to understand the voice who speaks within us to live for you. And God, that we would grow in that. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.